Well, just a word of introduction about <clears throat> the piece of paper you have in your hands. Uh, when I was at seminary, I took a class in Synoptic Gospels from Dr. Malcolm Maxwell, and it was really a great class. It opened my eyes to things that I hadn't seen before. And unfortunately, I, it took me 40 years to learn what I'm going to share with you, <clears throat> and maybe you already know it, which is great. But um, as I have moved through prayer meeting, I've gone through the Desire of Ages and Christ's Object Lessons, and I never got around to going through the miracles. So after I retired, I did that, and I think that's where I stumbled across the structure of the book of Matthew. And it's really opened my eyes to uh, rich, appreciating what Matthew was doing in a richer way. You'll notice that uh, this piece of paper is uh, entitled an outline of the book of Matthew. Somewhere I've got one. Here we go. And uh, there are actually six panels, if you could envision them, across the stage. And they're connected by hinges. Uh, and the hinges are transitionary statements. <clears throat> and the panels repeat the pattern, narrative teaching, narrative teaching, narrative teaching, narrative teaching. That's done six times. And the question I'd like to pose for you, because I'm not going to exhaust that, and I have it myself, is what is the relationship between the teaching and the narrative section? Could that help us really understand what Jesus was trying to teach if we go back to the previous narrative. And just to illustrate that on the first page, you'll notice that it's the, uh, the, the narrative is about Jesus' birth, his genealogy, the visit of the Magi, the escape to Egypt, the return to Nazareth, uh, the preaching of John the Baptist that prepares the way, uh, the baptism of Jesus, and all of these are really divine affirmations of who Jesus is. It's almost like they are his credentials so that when he gives a message, he can speak with authority. Uh, the father himself affirmed his son, saying, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. And so we have divine credentials, the divine providential leading, the interposition of the uh, angel who redirected them to go to Egypt and then to come back to uh, uh, Nazareth when it was safe. And of course, John the Baptist's own history is filled with miracles. And then it goes on to introduce the first disciples and, and uh, shows that Jesus is healing the sick. Then you come into the teaching section. And you're, of course, familiar with the Beatitudes and uh, all the subsequent things that Jesus um, Probably most of us are more familiar with Matthew 5 through 7 than we are with uh, other portions of the book of Matthew. <clears throat> but maybe this will open our eyes to appreciate uh, those other parts that we don't know about, know as much about. And I know you're not Greek scholars, and my Greek is not where I want it to be, but I can pick out you know, some of the letters like you. I know what an alpha is and an omega and those kind of things. But if you open your sheet to the middle page, you'll see three yellow highlighted sections. It's in Greek, and I know you're not an expert in Greek, but if you just compare each of those sentences in Greek, you'll know that they're exactly the same. So as you look at these transitional sentences that are identified uh, in red, there's five of them. There's more, if you read your English Bible, it of course doesn't say it in Greek, it says it in English, and if you looked at it in English, you wouldn't necessarily find that they were exactly the same. In fact, there are some embellishments. But these same six Greek words occur in each of these five sentences. So there is a, obviously there is a structural development that uh, Matthew has engaged in. And I want to raise the question again, what is the relationship between the teaching of Jesus and the narrative that precedes that? Maybe it can help us. And so I would invite you to uh, Matthew 13, where our uh, text was taken from. And as you know, Matthew 13 is the uh, parable. We have eight parables. And their relationship is interesting also, but we don't have time to get into that. But you'll notice that if you read through the parables, Jesus gives an explanation of the sower. 
who it is and what he's sown and who the, what the different soils are, what they represent. He also explains the second parable, which is the parable of the, is that the net? Um, no, it's the parable of the tares, where an enemy comes in and sows these tares. But in the subsequent parables, there's no explanation. Jesus doesn't explain. He says the kingdom of heaven is like, but that's about it. So I would invite your attention to find out and answer the question, who is the pearl of great price? And to assist us in that, and you may be right in what your answer is. Very likely you are. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to look back into the narrative section and look for comparative statements of value and see if those statements of value might help us understand who the pearl of great price is. So I'd invite you to chapter 12 and uh, verse 6 is the verse and there are three verses that almost are exactly alike, just a different name in each one. I tell you, Jesus said in response to this uh, discussion he was having to the, with the Pharisees, I tell you um, that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus is making a statement, somebody here is greater than the temple. Well, who is that? It's not the disciples. It's Jesus. And if you fast forward 30-some verses forward to verse 41, Jesus is talking, contrasting this uh, generation that is listening. In verse 39, he says, He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation, generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But now one greater than Jonah is here. And who is that? Jesus. It's Jesus. Going on to the next verse, 42. The queen of the south shall rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. And who might that be? It's Jesus. So, who is the pearl of great price? It is, but that's not the end of the story. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8. Going from that place, he went into their synagogue. Now, I don't know if you've come to the conclusion in your reading how purposeful Jesus' actions were. You know, we've all heard of the book Purpose Driven Life. Well, I think the ultimate purpose driven life is Jesus' life. He had a purpose in everything he did. He didn't just float into town and like Pollyanna and wonder what's going to happen. He was led there. And I don't know for sure if he knew why he was there when he went there or not. It really doesn't make any difference whether he knew what was going to happen and maybe the Father revealed those things to him. But here it says in verse 8, um, let's see, my print's so small I can hardly read it. Uh, not 8, um, what did I say? Yes, verse 6, I'm sorry. Well, let's start in verse 3. There's a paragraph there. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he, when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated, consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the Sabbath, on the Sabbath the priests of the temple desecrate that day and yet are innocent? And then the verse we've already read, I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Then in verse 9, going on from that place, he went into the synagogue. And here's that purpose-drivenness. 
there was a man there that needed to be healed. And it goes on to describe him, and a man with a shriveled hand was there looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And I can just imagine Jesus in his mind saying, I'm sure glad you asked that question. And he goes on to say, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Then that value statement, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So we have a parable that appears to cut both ways. To Jesus, who is the pearl seeker, broken people are the one who are the pearls of great price that he is seeking. And of course, he gives all in exchange for that. Uh, the next section, you have a, have a quotation from the Old Testament, where again, it is underscored that Jesus is the pearl of great price. And he's quoting from the prophet Isaiah. In verse 18, he sa it says, Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed will he not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. So the pearl of great price is Jesus. And we are his pearl of great price. And what I wanted to share with you was something that I had read in the last couple months, it was a story uh, written by the mother of one of my classmates. At least I think that's the case. Isabel Sterling was my classmate. Her brother Paul was a couple of years ahead of us. They were both very bright kids. Uh, one of them played the bassoon. That was Paul, and Isabel played the oboe. And for those of you who have been in band, you know that those are two of the most difficult instruments. Well. I don't think they were there very long. They weren't in grade school when I was in grade school. And I think that the parents, I'm not sure if it's a mom or dad, came to Stanford University and took some graduate work. Anyway, the mother's name was Marianne Sterling. And Marianne is a, a writer, and she had written this article. And it really moved me as I read through the article. She describes, she read this book by, um, what's her name? Um, Eileen Corey, who had written about the people who are in the pearl business, finding pearls. And um, they referred to the Gulf of Arabia, where this is done. Sometimes it's referred also to the Persian Gulf or the Gulf of Aqaba. But some of the world's most dazzling pearls have been discovered in this watery stretch. And there are generations, families with generations of pearl seekers in their family who have been in the business. The business is passed down from father to son and on down to the grandchildren. And this particular individual who she introduced uh, to us, his name is Alfredon. He was a 10th generation pearl dealer. And as they describe these pearls, they have a different word for each different colored pearl. And some are round and some are pearl, sh or some are um, uh, pear-shaped. They have yellow ones, black ones, white ones, with a soft blush that make them very, very valuable to them. Then there's the ugly gray ones. They're called the majhula. I'd never run across that term, but think about that. I, I purged this thing of all the Arabic names of the other colors so that we could remember this majhula. It's rough and dull, and majhula means unknown. And sometimes the unknown, this majhula, can turn out to be just as lustrous and as white and as beautiful as the one that comes in that condition. But the key is that the pearl seeker has to be very skilled and be able to peel away the layers that cover this pearl. And occasionally they will find this 
in the, that in this majula, below the surface, is this beautiful, white, lustrous, rose-colored uh, pearl. And I don't understand, I suppose if I did it, I would understand, but it's hard for me to grasp how in love these pearl seekers are with their pearls. And it's not to uh, necessarily sell the most, most valuable one. Often they will keep them. And they just, they uh, revel in the sight of these pearls that they have found. It just, when they're down in the dumps, they take them and they look at their pearl collection. They don't want to sell their pearl collection. It's not for sale. And so in her storytelling, she compares Jesus to somebody who's seeking these kind of pearls. And of course, Jesus isn't in the business of selling pearls. He's in the business of collecting them and spending whatever it costs him to acquire these precious pearls. In her story, she creates an imaginary uh, discussion or conversation between herself and Jesus. And so Jesus has this pearl in his hand, and she just begs him to see it. And so he opens a finger and allows the light to shine in in a particular way, and, and she, in amazement, in incredulously says, is that it? He nods. That can't be it, I say. It's gray and dull. It's rough and ugly. It's not a pearl of great price. You paid the awful, awful price, and they gave you a majula, a blistered, rough, ugly, gray pearl. He looks at the gray pearl, and his eyes shine with joy. They call it majula, unknown. He laughs, but not to me. It's not unknown to me. I know what's in there. And he cradles it in his hands triumphantly, the great dull thing. He knows how to peel the layers away from us who are his pearl of great price. We appear to be the majula. People look and ridicule how could he spend what he has on this dull majula, this unknown element? But he has a skill, and he has the patience to peel away the layers and layers and layers of our incurable grubbiness. And he's paid the price, and he has the pearl. And it's rough and ugly, and it's you and me. But he clutches it as that sacred hand with that sacred hand as the glorious bargain of the ages. As I think of stories to illustrate that, maybe your mind has wandered to Mary Magdalene. Certainly Simon thought that was a waste of time. Her story is very interesting. You know the story. I haven't known all the details, but it's as we continue our journey, sometimes we stumble across things we didn't know before. And if you've read Desire of Ages, you know that uh, <clears throat> Simon was uh, instrumental in leading Mary down that path where she had a, a reputation that none of us would want to have. How did she get there? It must have been a family secret. It's not revealed in the scriptures. And perhaps if it was known to others, nobody wanted to share it except euphemistically referring to her as a woman of ill repute ill repute, who had a bad reputation. But if you read Sons and, or Daughters of God on page, I think it's 238 and 239, maybe you've read it already and you've discovered that Simon was her uncle. Lazarus identifies as her uncle, so if she was his sister, then Simon was her uncle as well. And if you think about what might have happened, we don't know for sure, but it's speculation on my part but I've wondered if she may have been molested by Simon when she was just a teenager or maybe prepubescent. And so this started her, this launched her down this path. And she became a practitioner of that. And uh, so he knew. Well, he was objecting to Jesus 
being touched by this woman. If you knew who this woman was and what she had done, you wouldn't allow her to touch you. But she was there, um, broken and spilled out. Uh, she released this fragrance that filled the room. And of course, everybody's attention was attracted to that. And Jesus, in his excellence of being a pearl seeker, did not blow the situation. He didn't expose Simon. Simon was just as important to, sorry. <clears throat> Simon was just as important to Jesus as Mary was. And so he didn't expose him. He could have, <clears throat> but he didn't. And uh, Simon was very impressed by Jesus. You know he had been healed already. We don't know when that happened, but obviously it was before this. In Luke's rendition, no, I think it's Matthew and Mark's rendition, he is identified as Simon the leper. In, in Luke's edition, he is identified as Simon the Pharisee. And there are particular reasons why I think he's identified th that way in those particular Gospels. I'm sure all of you have heard Steve Green sing. Maybe you've got uh, recordings of his music. And it's uh, moving to hear him do that. But it makes me think of the song that he sings uh, called Broken and Spilled Out. And part of the lyrics go like this. Lord, you were God's tr precious treasure, his loved and his own perfect son, sent here to show me the love of the Father. Just for love it was done. And though you were perfect and holy, you gave up yourself willingly. You spared no expense for my pardon. You were used up and wasted for me. Broken and spilled out just for love of me, Jesus, God's most precious treasure, lavished on me. You were broken and spilled out and poured at my feet in sweet abandon. Lord, you were spilled out and used up for me. So I'd like to close with a question. Do you realize that you are the priceless pearl that he has been seeking? I invite you to turn in your hymnals to, I think it's hymn number 189.
how thankful we are, Father, that Jesus went on this pearling mission to seek us. We're grateful that he has promised that no one can snatch us out of his hand. We pray that you will complete this process of revealing yourself in us as you peel away the layers, penetrating through our brokenness, through our weaknesses, and that we might find him to be our strength and our joy and our sufficiency, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen.